10,000 years ago, great glaciers spanned the Earth. As the planet warmed, making way for evolution, the glaciers melted, but did not leave without a trace. In their passing, a new generation was spawned, the glacial lakes. Among these was Agassiz, the great glacial lake of the West. The sands of time slowly led to the retreat of the large lakes, but left many offspring, giving shape and texture to the Earth as we know it now. Two such children were the lake and river we call Rainy. Attracted to these shores were the first people, the Paleo Indians. Many centuries ago they arrived to find a climate that was cold and harsh, unimaginable even by our standards today. But time passed and the globe continued to warm. Climates improved and the archaic culture arrived leaving their mark in the form of copper-forged knives, awls, and more. The laurel and black duck arrived, leaving burial mounds and fragrance of pottery. These are the early ancestors of the most recent First Nations to inhabit the region, the Ojibwe. They still hold claim to the land upon which we stand. All of these societies lived and breathed the very air we breathe today. The proof is in what they left behind for each left remnants of their cultures, vague hints about who they were and how they lived. The first white man known to have visited the Rene Lake area was Jacques de Noyant in 1688. He built a post on the south side of Rainy River, now between International Falls and Rainier. Thirty years later, the route from Winnipeg to Lake Superior had become somewhat well known and French fur traders were campaigning for a post on Rainy Lake due to its ready accessibility and plethora of resources. By 1732, they had their wish. Fort St. Pierre was erected in honor of Pierre Gauthier sur de la Vrandry on the banks of Rainy Lake. This marked the beginning of continued white occupation. In fact, we hold the title of oldest continuously occupied white settlement west of the Great Lakes. La Verandre holds a special place in the hearts of our community. His name is emblazoned on our great hospital and we recognize the waterway in which he traveled on the upper Rainy River. As for the fort itself, it was used frequently since inception by La Verandre and others. However, around 1760, it was abandoned after the fall of New France. A replica stood in the vicinity of the original site as a reminder of those who explored this region. A decade later, the ease of travel and abundance of furs found by La Verandre lured the Northwest Trading Company to establish a post on the yet unnamed and undeveloped site of Fort Francis. This post, brandished Fort Lac La Pluie, or Rainy Lake House, was the largest and most important in the Rainy River District. Today, its site is marked by a cairn and a plaque. Years later, a powerhouse known as the Hudson's Bay Company built a post at Manitou Rapids, staying for a short while while relocating below the falls on the Rainy River. For years to follow, the two companies battled for supremacy, neither willing to yield. But finally, in 1821, the battle was over. The two were united and a new, more powerful Hudson's Bay Company was born. Nine years later, in 1830, the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, George Simpson, was on a tour for inspection purposes. Accompanying him was his beautiful bride, Lady Frances Ramsey Simpson. In June, they reached Rainy Lake, delighting in its inherent beauty. She says, we reached the establishment of Lac La Pluie at 12 o'clock. The establishment is delightfully situated on the east bank of the river overlooking a beautiful waterfall to the south. While Mr. Simpson and Mr. Cameron were transacting business, Mr. McMurray bowled me around the fort and garden, and old and weather-beaten as he was, he surpassed all the gentlemen I had met in these wilds as a ladies' man. And the gentleman replied, and the impression of you, my lady, was no less impressive. 
On September 25, 1830, Fort Lac La Pluie was renamed Fort Francis in honor of Lady Francis. In 1857, the Canadian government sent Simon Dawson and Henry Hind to explore the region between Lake Superior and Winnipeg. They suggested a water and land trail following the Voyager Road. They suggested it be laid between Winnipeg and the Northwest to facilitate the settlement of the region. Ten years later, that became a reality as General Garnet Wolseley left Under Bay for Fort Garry in the Winnipeg area to quell the rebellion led by Louis Riel. They built roads, cleared brush and boulders, and they built bridges and established what would become known as the Dawson Trail, passing through Fort Francis and the Rainy River District. Before the settlement of the area could begin in earnest, more progress would have to be made. An agreement must be reached with the first peoples occupying the land. In 1870, Robert J. N. Pither of the Hudson's Bay Company was sent to Fort Francis to negotiate with the Ojibwe people. Settling at Pither's Point Park as Indian agent at Fort Francis, Pither was able to secure Treaty 3 in 1873. The promise of reserves, resources, money, and more was made in exchange for use of the land to which they held claim. The area that Pither settled in has since become an attractive spot for tourists as well as very popular for local activity in the new millennium. At the same time as this, a dispute had arisen between Manitoba and Ontario over the Rainy River District. Each province claimed the land and over the years to come, it would change provincial standing several times. The securing of treaties opened the area for settlement and the agricultural boom was beginning. The push to settle the West was on and as Alexander Mackenzie took over the reins at the head of our country, a plan was born to build connecting links between navigable waterways and connection with American railroads. This plan became known notoriously by some as the amphibious route. In 1875, construction of a canal at Fort Francis began. During this time, as the Dawson Trail passed through potential farmland, more and more people began settling, and the lumber market began to open up as well. The Free Grants and Homestead Act of 1876 was established, granting land in 20 townships free of charge to bona fide settlers. In 1878, however, construction on the canal was halted following another government change. Railways became the transportation mode of choice, and the opening of the CPR at Rat Portage, that's Kenora, led settlers to take the journey by train and then access the Rainy River District by taking a steamer across the Lake of the Woods and up the Rainy River. In 1883, an election year for Ontario, the territorial clash between Ontario and Manitoba was brought to a head. Finally, it was decided that Ontario held proper claim to the lands west of Thunder Bay and the decision was made official with the Ontario Boundary Act signed in 1889. Growing beyond the post of the Hudson's Bay Company, the community appointed J. O. Armit as its first postmaster. With mail originally coming over the Dawson Trail, steamboats were also used for local service. By 1887, the first school of Fort Francis was built and aptly named the Little Red Schoolhouse. The only thing holding the community back now was a lack of organization. So in 1891, the town established its first organized government body. On May 30th, the municipality of Alberton was established. It included the townships of Roddick, McCurvin, Crozier, and the village of Fort Francis. Within a few years as agriculture grew, Fort Francis had become a thriving farming community and was developing as a center for the entire district. As such, the business community quickly took advantage of the growing population, especially the two hotels, the Albertan and the Kuchichin. With promises of a railway to come, Fort Francis and Kuchichin decided to build a footbridge to join the two communities. It was also at this time that the first of the organized clubs, such as the Orange Order and the Granite Masonic Lodge, first began to hold meetings. In 1897, Things really had started to pick up, and an influx of new businesses exploded onto the scene. 
All along the original business district, Front Street, shops were opening up. Mr. G. M. Wilson operated a general store, as did Mr. H. Williams. W. A. Baker worked as a merchant tailor, and W. G. Brecken started a bakery and confection store. There were also Mr. L. Christie's Meat Market and Emmy Needs Drug Store. Shortly after a gold rush at Mine Center drew prospectors to the area, lawyers began arriving, and D.J. Gillen, land surveyor, began to map the district. A year later, Fort Francis and her compatriots became known officially as the Rainy River District. Completing the boom of activity were Mr. Elias Hutchison and his ferry boat, Customs Officers Isherwood and Marsh, the Doctors Birdsall and Moore, joining Dr. Robertson and the dentist Dr. M. Miller, and finally, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, set up in 1899. Scott Street School was also built as the flurry of activity caused an uprising in child population. The little red schoolhouse simply was too little. Now, 1899 was a very big year for Fort Francis, although nobody knew it at the time. When Edward Backus first came to the Rainy River District in Fort Francis, he was walking on a clear moonlit night, and he viewed the wonderful falls and decided to become a real pioneer. Backus saw the future of power developments, paper mills, and sawmills. Soon after, he became president of the newly organized Kuchichin Lumber. In his sights, the Kuchichin Falls and the awesome power contained therein. He immediately took steps towards construction of a dam that would harness that power and enable it to be converted to energy. Seeing the future in Fort Francis, James Alexander Osborne of Kuchichin moved his entire newspaper operation piece by piece by canoe across the river. This was the start of the Fort Francis Times publisher of the Daily Bulletin and other gems. The early 90s were also an important time for railroad developments and the community development as well. Over the course of the next decade, many gaps would be bridged by railroad, facilitating communications, development, and transportation, all of which proved a very dear item in bringing people to settle in the town. John Reed Sr. opened a sawmill on six acres of land on the riverbank right along the street. The value of the vast timber resources was soon to be realized. In 1903, the citizens of the village of Fort Francis undertook to petition the government to incorporate their town. Seventy-five men signed a petition and humbly declared that the said land contained within it all the residents of the municipality of McCurvin and they estimated the population to be between 600 and 700. With graded streets, sidewalks, and street lights, the petitioners felt the need to constitute a town corporation with the powers incident to such. The appointing of a constable brought law and order to the town, and the council proceeded to look at improvements to infrastructure and the development of the community. Setting the groundwork for industrial growth, the council took an active interest in the negotiations of E.W. Backus, and finally by 1905, the most important project in Fort Francis history was set to begin. Mr. Backus had obtained everything he needed, and construction was begun on the dam. The harnessing of the power of the falls was a godsend, bringing in hundreds of workers and their families. Business was once again beginning to boom, and the population was expanding. The long-established parishes of the Catholic Church, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Anglicans all looked forward to increasing their congregations and expanding their facilities. The council undertook to build a seat of government in 1905, and the construction of a town hall included an opera house, library room, and a fire hall to house the newly established volunteer fire brigade. Ironically, this was too little too late, as a $250,000 fire decimated the whole of Front Street, completely destroying Frank Stern's barber shop, Wells Hardware, the Alberton Hotel, and many others. Even more ironic is the fact that a brand new steam-operated fire engine sat idle on a railway flat car as the fire did its work, the result of a disagreement between town officials and the manufacturer. 
Shortly after, the two reconciled, realizing the error of their ways. While a disaster, the fire really marked the beginning of a modern and progressive town. The rebuilding of the business district saw the move to Scott Street, due in part to high prices of waterfront property, and Main Street, as we know it now, was born. In 1910, the border issue saw International Falls enter the fray. With the idea that the boundary fell to their north, they felt that they owned Fort Francis and prepared to enter the community and hang the stars and stripes. However, when some resourceful Canadian engineers found an early survey showing a Canadian boundary to the south of the International Falls area, the dispute was soon over. In 1910, the dam was completed, incorporated under the name Minnesota and Ontario Power Company, thus channeling the power of the falls and putting it to work on both sides of the border. This was a very momentous event, one which paved the way for the completion of the International Bridge in 1912, after which there was a day-long celebration. Also in 1912, Chevlin Clark purchased land from John Reed Sr. and opened a large sawmill. Over the years, Chevlin Clark processed over 1,600,000,000 feet of lumber. They employed 1,500 people and paid out more than $12 million in wages. One final note for the year was the beginning of construction of a paper mill. On May 14, 1914, the first newsprint rolled off number 5 paper machine with startup on number 6 on July 6. The startup expected to employ some 300 men with a payroll of $200,000 a year. Following this string of major construction and industrial developments, the next few years were comparatively quiet. A library was opened, and due to ever-increasing population, Robert Moore School was erected in honor of Dr. Robert Moore, noted horticultural authority and former mayor. Tourism was steadily becoming a more important slice of the economic pie and Mr. Lloyd and Watson took over this opportunity and they opened a tourist outfitter store which provided all necessary gear for a camping trip on Rennie Lake for the small fee of $50. Not surprisingly, these men were very successful. In the mid-1910s, World War I had shown its ugly face. The war had tremendous impact on Fort Francis with men leaving their families and jobs, many never to return, to fight so that we wouldn't have to. Soldiers that trained in Fort Francis were members of the 141st Battalion. These men fought for their country, they fought for our country, they fought for the people of their time, and they fought for us, their brothers and sisters of the future. Private W.C. Miller chronicled the lives of the men of the 52nd Battalion as they fought in the trenches in his book, From Thunder Bay to Ypres with the Fighting 52. The post-war prosperity of the 1920s saw a peak in social and recreational events in the community. A curling club skating rink combo was built at the corner of Nelson Street and Portage Avenue. A lawn bowling club and tennis court were set up east of the courthouse and at Pithers Point the pavilion and a nine-hole golf course opened to summer enthusiasts. In 1921, J.A. Matthew, the former manager of the Chevlin Clark Mill, established the J.A. Matthew Lumber Company on Sand Bay. This marked the beginning of Matthew's dominance in the logging industry. In the next 40-some-odd years, he owned and operated, at various times, as many as 10 mills. He also went on to establish the Matthew Education Foundation, which allowed students to pursue higher learning through loans secured by his revolving trust. A year after his entry into the logging field, Fort Francis High School was built. In the 1950s, Matthew would be recognized for his generosity funding an auditorium built in his name. By the end of the 1920s, a building boom saw the post office open and the Masonic building and the G.G. Baker block rounded off three of the corners at Portage and Scott in downtown Fort Francis. Excursions on the lake remained popular 
and daily boats ventured to the Cascades on the northern tip of Rainy Lake. Local businessmen saw the opportunity of attracting visitors and supported the construction of a modern hotel. By the end of the 1920s, the Rainy Lake Hotel opened as a fine tourist hotel. In the 1930s, the Great Depression had set in, leading to the demise of great industries such as Shevlin Clark and sending the paper mill into receivership. True to most of the country, the economy was at an all-time low. Labor unrest was prevalent and hundreds of unemployed men flooded the community. Families were broken, faith was shaken, but somehow the glue held because Fort Francis never came apart. By the end of the 30s, optimism was evident as plans were well underway for the building of a hospital and the Ontario government opened the Kenora-Fort Francis Highway. At this point, tourism exploded to an all-time high, becoming a more major driving force behind the economy, not only of Fort Francis, but all of northwestern Ontario. People were flocking to the area at a shocking pace, and it seemed as though Fort Francis was destined to become a major city of the West. However, in 1940, the planet once again erupted into war. During World War II, men of the Fort Francis District joined the 37th Field Battery. Many men from Fort Francis fought in the war. Others were part of the mill at that time. The mill was issued a contract to produce war materials such as gun mounts and sights. Trees were planted in the Rainy River District as a living memorial to the men and women who served during World War II across 900 acres. A ceremony took place to inaugurate the event. After the war, things gradually returned to near normal. The town and its people did their best to move on and continue with their lives. In 1948, the township of McCurvin was annexed, increasing the acreage of Fort Francis from 1,048 to nearly 5,500 acres. In 1951, the Memorial Arena was built, reaping the benefits were the Fort Francis Canadians winning their fifth consecutive NAHL championship over the Hibbing Flyers. These Canadians were fast becoming a staple of the community and a source of pride and adoration among the people. They would soon go on to win the Allen Cup in 1952. Arts and culture were recognized as an important element of the community and the Fort Francis Little Theater Group was established. And a few years later, the Pallet Club, forerunner to the Fort Francis Arts and Crafts Association, was formed. Archaeologists arrived at the ancient burial mounds alongside the Rainier Rapids, excavating and cataloging over 3,000 artifacts. Coinciding with their arrival was the start of a fundraising campaign to rebuild Laverandre's Fort St. Pierre. The August 1960 opening of the subway on Portage Avenue was the next major project undertaken by the town. To this day, the use of the word subway to describe the underpass continues to mystify newcomers to our lovely town. In 1965, the final pieces were in place with the opening of Highway 11 and the beautiful Noden Causeway between Fort Francis and Atacokan. The new ease of travel along the Voyager Highway route resulted in new development to the east. Permanent homes became a reality on the shores of Rainy Lake. The Kiwanis Club of Fort Francis began construction of a new dining hall and kitchen facility at Sunny Cove, at the time the largest log building in northwestern Ontario. Movement through our First Nations neighbors community of Kuchichin led in 1983 much to the delight of sliding enthusiasts everywhere, the opening of a train overpass. By the mid-1980s, the end of an era was evident. The role of the river and lake in the log drives of yesteryear were quickly coming to a close. The causeway created quick access by road to timber and camps. In 1985, Captain Bill Lloyd pulled his last tug from the upper river after providing transportation since 1905. The log tug Hallett, the largest and most powerful tug once hauling logs on the lake, was placed in a permanent landlocked location. 
Through the 1970s, the community undertook to develop recreational facilities, opening a swim pool complex with squash courts and a weight room, and establishing the 18-hole Kitchen Creek Golf Course. In 1980, headlines once again read, International Bridge Opens. A common theme throughout the history of the community, the question of bridge location, customs facility, and crossing fee remain a constant discussion. The 90s began fairly quietly, much like the previous decade. However, in 1993, the new Fort Francis Curling Club building was erected, proving that curling was indeed alive and well in Fort Francis. Over the next few years, there were a few noteworthy developments. The Juggernaut Fishing Tournament, our very own Fort Francis Canadian Bass Championship, was inaugurated. Today, it is one of the top sources of tourist interest in our area. It has been televised nationally by TSN. By the end of the 1990s, the development of the Two Mile Upper Rainy River was well underway. Walking and biking trails grace the river bank. The Sorting Gap Marina marks the site once held by the Chevlin Clark Company. The development continues into 2003 when the new Lavrandre Parkway will be officially opened. Entering into the new millennium, we survived Y2K. True to tradition, we carried on in the footsteps of the past and saw the new Memorial Sportsplex open with the Ice for Kids Arena taking center stage for the newly formed Fort Francis Thunder to capture our attention and also assist our Muskies return to glory in Ofsa. We entered the new millennium with a new multi-use facility, home of the Fort Francis High School and Confederation College. Included was the Townsend Theatre, a venue for the annual Tour de Fort concert series showcasing various talents from around the globe and a site for the community to showcase its talented citizens. And now this year, 2003, we celebrate 100 years of memories and prosperity. And we begin anew, ready for the next hundred and all that it may bring. Over the years, people came and people went. Businesses were opened and businesses closed. Life was created and life ended as well. And all within the gentle caress of Rainy Lake. Her timeless beauty encompasses us all. Today, our town is not quite the metropolis it was once expected to become, but we are blessed with the most beautiful, elegant community. Nature at her finest is all around. Our northern lights have the power to hold a gaze for hours on end. At a time when such things as stars and sky don't much matter, Fort Francis pays no heed. A place where eyes still hold a kindly gaze and hands still move in a friendly wave, a place of friendship, of family, a place full of memories and dreams. This is where we live. We call it Fort Francis. She's beautiful, she's quiet and small, and really, we wouldn't have it any other way.